Good morning. Sure is good to see everybody here this morning, especially my brother over there. <laughs> We've been missing you, both of you. Sure is good when we ask for something in prayer and we receive it the way we ask for it. It's, uh, it's also good for us to understand that we may not always get what we ask for the way we ask for it. And I hope we can be as complimentary of the Lord, blessing the Lord as much as we do when we get what we want. The title, When is Enough Enough? Anybody have a clue? <laughs> uh, I, I've been having uh, various ones look up songs that fit. Uh, this you can sympathize with, Mel. Um, I, I don't think anybody knew what to do with this title. When is enough enough? When is it, you know, that, um, that God does not hear our prayers? That's a, that's a serious question. When is it that we, uh, we get so far away from God that he turns his face from us? You know, we were studying in John chapter 9 the story of the blind man that was healed, uh, been blind from birth. And the Lord Jesus spit in his hands and made clay with mud, with dirt, and then put it in his eyes and then told him to go wash and he did and he was healed never seen anything can you imagine a trip back from the pool of Siloam can you imagine his thoughts on the way back from there seeing things that he had never seen before being able to take in all of the beauty of God's creation the magnificence of that big temple to see all those things for the first time and then to have people doubt that he ever was blind. It must have been frustrating for him. But when you stop and think about what the Lord Jesus faced in that situation, people not believing in him, even though he had just healed somebody who had been blind from the day they were born. In this exchange back and forth when the, when the blind man was defending the fact that he was the one that was healed and when he was telling them that they should believe in Jesus <laughs> and they were having none of it, the statement was made, we know that God does not hear the prayers of sinners like it was an absolute fact. It never, it never occurred to them that God would hear the prayers of sinners. Well, I, along with many, many others, pray that's not true, that God does hear the prayers of sinners. But God does not hear the prayers of a wicked man. We've talked about that a number of times, and I, I want us to think about this, what was read to begin with, where Jesus made the statement in Matthew, in John, that my sheep hear my voice. They, they hear, they know, my sheep know my voice and they will listen to me and they will come when I call them and that's part of being the kind of person that God will hear the prayers of. But at the same time, I want us to go back to Isaiah there and I want us to look at the very beginning of the book of Isaiah. I want to talk a little bit about why Isaiah was written. Isaiah comes at a time when the northern kingdom is continuing to be evil. You know, they had 19 kings, and they never had a good one. They never had one that led them back to God. They were the Israelites. But this is why Israel was called Israel. Israel, which means struggled with God. And these people struggled with God from the inception of that northern kingdom. 
Never did. Never did come to God. And because of that, Isaiah, one of the first, not the first, Joel was a little ahead of Isaiah. But Isaiah, about 845, began preaching and teaching and telling these people that you folks are destined to trouble. And here's what he says in verse 2. I want to read this again. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth. Now this was written, let me, let me back up just a, again for just a second. This is written during the days of Uzziah, who was a good king, and Ahaz and Hezekiah, all of them fairly good kings. Hezekiah was a very good one. But at the same time, they had kings of, Ju- of Israel that were not. He says, listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons, I have reared and brought up. Now, think about this, because this is God talking about his children. His children, the children of Israel. He says, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner. Out of all of those that heard the voice of Jesus... Remember in John 1 it says he came unto his own and his own did not receive him. The majority? No. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Here, 800 years, 850 years before the Lord, we have Isaiah making the same statement. An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. They don't recognize the voice of God. My people do not understand. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers. Sons who act corruptly. I don't think there's anything in the world that can make a parent feel worse than having their children act corruptly. To have them do things that you would never, never, never approve of. To have them act in such a way that anybody who knows you is shamed by what they've done. That's a terrible thing. And God feels the same way. I've I've thought many times about this, how this affects our attitude toward adopting or choosing elders in a congregation how unfair people can be about a human being raising children when you read this passage and you understand that God did everything that he could do with his children yet most of them turned against him most of them violated every law that he had I I was looking at the list of kings All of them in Israel bad. About half of them in the southern kingdom, Judah, were somewhat good. We have men like Manasseh. Manasseh was the worst that there ever was until he wasn't. And it's that that I want us to focus on this morning as we read on down in Isaiah and we understand what happened with Manasseh. Manasseh was one of those that did everything evil and combined the northern kings were not as bad as Manasseh was. He even put his children through the fire, which means he offered them to pagan gods. And finally, God had had enough. I want us to read on down here in Isaiah. It says, Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head there is nothing sound in it. Only bruises and welts and raw wounds not pressed out or bandaged nor softened with oil. This is a mess right here. Your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your fields, strangers are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation as overthrown by strangers. 
The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Nothing that even hintly resembles what it used to be. He says in verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord. You rulers of Sodom, he's calling Jerusalem Sodom. He's referring to this as what is recognizably the worst two cities that have ever been on the face of the earth, but he's calling Jerusalem (coughs) by that despicable name. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I think we've reached that point. I think we have gotten to the place now, right here, where God does not hear the prayers of these sinners. He says, I have had enough of your burnt offerings of rams, the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats. Somehow I think they had the idea that the more they sinned, all they had to do was add more animals to the burn pile, and God would be pleased with it. He says, I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and goats, I can see God looking down on this situation and he was the one that had way back there in Genesis chapter 4 given them the means of reconciliation when they sinned. That is their forgiveness when they did what they were told to do when they offered those sacrifices so that they would understand that the price of sin is death. God substituted the animals. It didn't take away sin. It didn't pay for sin. But it removed it from their shoulders at the time. And God said to uh, to, uh, Cain and Abel what to do. He told them what to do. We find that Cain decided that that wasn't going to be good enough for him. He had something better that he was going to offer. You know, I I appreciated your thoughts, Michael, on on this memorial. And how many ways that this has been changed by people who have a better way of remembering Jesus. A better way. Cain thought, I've got the best vegetables in the world. And he substituted those for the animals. Why kill one of my sheep? I'll give the Lord a cabbage or a turnip. What he didn't know, what he didn't seem to realize, was that there was a lesson in that. The lesson was that blood is the price of sin. Life is in the blood, and blood is the price that must be paid. So, they decide, we'll just add more animals. When you come to appear before me, they did keep coming. They kept coming. They kept coming to the temple. Who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Instead of God rejoicing that his people were coming, he was looking at this as a trampling of his courts. Do you think that he's listening to their prayers at this point? He says, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. He wasn't against their coming. He was against their coming with iniquity. I hate your new moon festivals, your appointed feasts. Do you notice how many ways he says that he doesn't like this? I've had enough. He says, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Why are you trampling my courts? Man, sounds to me like enough is enough. The Lord's fed up. He says, when you spread out your hands in prayer, here we go. I will hide my eyes from you. So there is a time when the Lord will not hear our prayers. 
Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. But just about the time that you think everything is hopeless, that God will never hear us again, something's possible. He says in verse 16, Wash yourselves. Wash your hands. Your hands are covered in blood. Wash the outside of the cup. What did Jesus say about that? You spend a lot of time making it look pretty. But inside it's full of dead men's bones. He says, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil from your deeds. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Wow. You know, there were a number of times in the southern kingdom. This never happened in the north. Never happened once they divided after Solomon's death. It never happened in the north. But a number of times in the south, they would find the book of the law. And they would be shocked that they weren't doing those things. And they would again start reading the book and start teaching the book and would start removing the things that were wrong from Israel. They would cease to do evil and learn to do good. He says, seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. And then he says something amazing to me. And it's what we're missing in our people, in churches, in our society, in our politics, in everything that we do. We're lacking this right here. It says, come now and let us reason together. You know, when I get to the point where I cannot tolerate someone differing with my opinion, I'm as good as gone. I'm as good as lost. Because I cannot recognize the truth if it's not what I already have then. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. God is pleading with His people to stop and look And listen, and let's talk this over. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Only the Lord can take something like murdering the Son of God and turn that over and make us white as snow. You know, I'm convinced that there is nothing in this world that I could do that would keep God mad at me if I determine I want to change. That this, in Mark chapter 3, where the Lord says there's one unforgivable sin, and that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is more important than Jesus. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is more important than God. It means that when you take that last ditch effort from God to convince me of right and wrong, I take that and I attribute it to something other like the devil. When I won't listen to his last voice to me, there's nothing to save me. There's nothing to change me. There's nothing to reverse my actions, to reverse my course. There's nothing to snatch me from the fires of hell. I will go where I want to go. He says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool, white wool. If you consent, if you consent and obey, 
There's two things here. If I will say, okay. If I will just say, yes, Lord. If I will just say, please help me. If I will say what we were reading last week about what they said about Jesus when he came into the city. Hosanna! Do you know what that means? That means, help me! Save me! That's what that means. Hosanna, Lord! Please help me. It was very important to the Lord to bring this up very early in his Sermon on the Mount. As a matter of fact, it's the very first. The very first of his Beatitudes was this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That means, help me. That means you have no reservation. Nothing in this world will keep you from accepting the help that Jesus has offered. If you will consent and obey. The problem is, we get stiff-necked. We get uncircumcised of heart and ears. We get to the point where we can't be told that we're wrong. We are living in a society that refuses to come. Let us reason together, says the Lord. This is becoming something that I am deeply impassioned about. I worry about our country. I worry about our cities. I worry about our schools. I worry about our churches. I worry about us. Because we need to learn to reason together, says the Lord. To have an open mind. Not so open that our brains slosh out, but an open mind to receive the truth when it differs from what we already believe. They were so certain that more animals would be the answer to their sin. Do whatever you want. Pay the price. Do whatever you want. Come now. Let us reason together says the Lord. You know what we saw here, where he says, learn, cease to do evil and learn to do good. Let's go back to the New Testament. I want to look at something that Paul says. Now we've, we've covered this a lot of times, but man, I'll tell you what, it never loses its, its, its impact. In chapter 4 of Ephesians, where Paul says the very first, very first, very first thing that you have to do. He says, therefore, laying aside falsehood, laying aside falsehood. You know, the problem that we have today, I don't know what the truth is in a lot of things. When you hear facts on both sides, and people can take facts and they can turn them any which way they want to turn them. And everybody has an argument that is absolutely diametrically, uh, yeah, that, that, that word, opposed to the other one. <laughs> How do you even deal with that? Here's what Paul says. Therefore, but in order to understand what therefore is all about, he said, go back up to verse 20. When he's talking about the, the Gentile world is just cloaked in this darkness, this ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart. But in verse 20 he says, but you did not learn Christ in that way. What you learned from Jesus was how to act and how not to act. He says, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus. You can count on that. You can take that 
wherever you take it to make sure you got it. I'd say to the bank, but that, that might not be the best place to take something. He says that in reference to your former manner of life, you'll lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in the righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, that's why we set aside anything that has any hint of darkness to it. Laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry. That's a human trait. That's a God trait. Do you know? Being angry is a trait of God. That's something that we can do. But don't sin when you do it. He says, do not let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil a place. Here he starts with the take this out and put this in. He says, let him who steals, don't steal anymore. Just that simple. If you're a thief, don't steal anymore. Uh, that, that makes my hair hurt sometimes because you can't just stop something. You can't just take something out because when you take something out it leaves a vacuum it will be filled with something what he says though is what to fill it with if you steal if you're a thief you want to stop that I'll tell you how to stop that you take the stealing out and you put working in in its place and you put the working in in its place so that here's the reason for it you can have something to give to him who has need. We've discussed this before. But I guarantee you, if you're working all the time so that you can get something to give to somebody that needs it, you will never, ever, ever in your life be a thief again. It totally changes the mindset. It changes you from a, a taker, a devourer, into a giver and a protector. That's how we change ourselves. That's how we cease to do evil and learn to do good, as Isaiah was saying nearly a thousand years ahead of this. It's something that we need to understand the process, the process of changing from one which is like our father, the devil, into being like our father, who is in heaven. There's a this song that we had. I want to I want to look at it just very briefly. The song that we sang, I think is as I was singing it, I was thinking, man, this really fits with what I want to try and get across. Years I spent in vanity and pride number 381. If you want to read the song with me, it'd be good. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not that my Lord was crucified. Knowing not that it was for me he died on Calvary. By God's word, at least at last my sin I'd learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Important words here follow. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Man. 
my thoughts go back to that worst of all kings that I talked about, Manasseh. Not many people talk about Manasseh this way, but it's my favorite way to talk about Manasseh. He reigned for 55 years. That's a long time for a king to reign. 50 of those years, he did the most evil of any king. Until God sent the Assyrians after him. And they captured him in Jerusalem. And they put a hook in his nose. And pulled him behind a chariot to Nineveh. I can't, I can't even imagine what that was like for a man who had been a king for 50 years, dictating to everyone what life was going to be, leading the people in evil ways that nobody had seen before. And then one day he's behind a chariot being pulled to Nineveh. Can you imagine what it was like? What, what happened if he fell? What happened if he couldn't keep up? What happened if he just slowed down? Uh, do you imagine that they were gently nudging him along? What a step down that would be to be on the throne one minute and behind a chariot the next. It tells us that he humbled himself before his God, and he prayed. Here's a guy who's been doing the wrong thing worse than anybody else for 50 years. But when he changed his mind... When he went from being belligerent to being a blasphemer of the Holy Spirit to a believer and a supplicator, God heard him. Here's one of those cases where I, I, don't, I don't think there's a point ever that we, if we have the ability to recognize the truth and we turn back to God we will not be saved I don't think there is a point so when you read this and you read about the years that he spent in vanity like this song vanity and pride caring not anything about what God had done if he had been a in the Christian era, he wouldn't have cared anything about what the Lord had done, that the Lord died. But mercy there was great. And grace was free. And God re redeemed him from that misery in Assyria, put him back on his throne. Here's the part that I like about Manasseh. He spent the rest of his life trying to right that ship. Trying to do, he did everything he could. And it says that he removed everything that, that he had put there. Except the people still offered sacrifices on the high places. But they didn't dare do it to anybody but God. At least he had brought them back that far. One of the final ironies of all of this is that the one who wrote that book of Isaiah was probably, we're pretty sure, sawn in two by this same Manasseh. Sawn in two about the 50th year just before Manasseh was taken away into captivity. He had Isaiah tied between two posts and sawn in two with a wood saw. And yet, the Lord was still willing to reason with him. 
Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Death is the only thing that separates us from the ability to turn. And I see so many of us reaching for that crossing. I want us all to come reason together with the Lord before that day that we can no longer make any changes in our destiny. If you're subject to the gospel in any way, if you know that your life is not right with God, come reason with the Lord. Come while we stand and sing the song that John has announced.